glad to see so many here this evening. I appreciate that. I also appreciate people that are dialing in. I understand we've got viewers all the way from San Antonio, Texas. So we're glad to have you all here. The talk tonight, when I first started thinking about it, was going to be something like a lecture, but I have gotten rid of that part entirely. We'll just stick with some stories. How's that going to sound? Uh, you, everything that you see on that screen right there is my family, our family keepsakes. Um, and if you, everything you see on the table, if you imagine the frame, the, the pictures that ring that table, just imagine the table and look at that. That was going to be my exhibit at Cabin Fever Reliever. Um, and we had an ice storm and nobody could come. So you're the only folks to see that display, the Cabin Fever Reliever. Um, some of the... <laughs> Every one of those was designed to tell a story. If you ask me about the banjo, I'd tell you about how it came in by covered wagon and was traded for five uh, gallons of sarcum molasses before they traveled on with their kids. You know, everything has a, a, a story, but there, some is a mystery to me. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you see uh, something of a baseball game going on. There's two mysteries about this picture. First of all, why did they think it was a good idea to have a pane glass window as the backstop? <laughs> and the second one was, if you look down at Jim Hughes' right leg, he's the batter, there's a cat wrapped around his ankle. <laughs> what do they think's going to happen if he actually gets a hit? Well, at any rate, such are the mysteries. The question up there is what is an Ozarker, or you can call it Ozarkian. I'm not particular about it. I prefer Ozarker myself. But what we're looking at is a central question because there's a modern answer to that, and it's not the same as what we're going to talk about. The modern answer is there are 48 separate languages spoken in the homes of children going to Springdale schools. The modern answer is, who lives in the Ozarks? That's not the Ozarks I'm talking about. I'm talking about one particular brand, which is I would refer to as old stock Ozarkers. We're talking about people that were here before the Civil War and fought the Civil War here. We're talking about people that have been here since the 1820s and 30s, old timers. And in that particular vein, we're gonna talk about some ideas. Now, I am going to show you slides of my family. You know, there'll be family pictures, but it's not because there's anything special about my family. That's like my grandpa's fishing buddy used to say, we're just common folk. We don't put on any airs, don't hold ourselves above anybody else. Now, that's not the reason for all that. The reason for the family pictures is because I can guarantee the authenticity of what you're looking at. Now, if I can see how to operate this fancy gizmo over here, let's see. Next. Okay. I will now have a rescue team. How do I advance the slide? This one. Okay. Did that work? There we go. Thank you. What you see at the top is a cradle song. It's a song that was sung to me when I was in the crib. And uh, it goes, my heart's in the highlands, my heart is not here. My heart's in the highlands, a chasing the deer, a chasing the wild deer and a chasing the roe. My heart's in the highlands wherever I go. <laughs> well, it's an older song, I know. <laughs> well, I couldn't read it, so I'm really glad. Well, all right. I'm glad to have that fixed then. But the point being is that real Ozark tradition, the old stock, starts at the crib. And it builds from there. And I'm going to give you some ideas as we go along. And here we go. Networking, it's not just a matter of learning songs inside of a family because families sing with other families. 
There are other, there are music parties where people get together and they network. Now here, I'm gonna give you a little lesson in networking, uh, just called passing it on. Now on the left-hand side, you see Roy and Joe Tilden in front of a log cabin. That cabin was built by Roy. That's the oldest fidd fiddler there. Uh, his, his father built it back in the 1870s. That cabin still stands. It's been covered over up with siding and it does have an additional room where you see the porch there just to the, uh, above the cat and to the uh, left of the cabin front there, the corner. And then you can see Joe in, in uh, much later years with his son-in-law, Robert Holt, in front of that same chimney. Well, they're both musicians, of course, and it was the, a rich area for music. Um, just down the road of peace was a fellow that was a traditional ballad singer. And their families are very musical and got together. They were uh, undiscovered by Vance Randolph. It was a pocket of traditional Ozarkers that he never got to, but I did. They became friends and they, I, you can see how they were plugged in there. We have um, two pictures there on the upper right. One is me playing music with Joe and the other one is with the son-in-law uh, playing banjo. And then you look down at the lower right-hand corner and you'll see where that music went to, right here at Shiloh. For four years, we had a ballad and traditional singing program that had uh, nine students total. Not all of them are in that picture, but nonetheless, by the time they finished, they had learned over a hundred traditional Ozark songs and ballads, more than half of which originated in the British Isles. So that's passing it on. Here we have an idea of tradition of another variety entirely. It's not musical, it's not storytelling. This is handiwork. This is stuff that women did to fare thee well. You can see that very background, that quilt right there, that's a hand zone. And that was rescued out of a chicken house out on our farm. Yeah, there was a bunch of quilts that were stacked in the chicken house for storage and the roof caved in and it rained on top of it. And they were ruined except for the bottom quilt and that's it. So that's an old piece right there. And if you'll take a look at the lady in the center, that's one of my great, great grandparents. Her name is uh, Martha Ann Perkins Pruitt, um, and she was from Kentucky. And if you'll take a careful look at that handiwork that's the background behind her, that is made out of flax that was done from scratch at her place. And she did all that needlework to make that piece. She's a Civil War widow. Uh, not everybody in the Civil War uh, died of battle or wounds. Uh, in her case, um, her husband died of smallpox. And in the last two weeks of his life, he could not return to his family because he wouldn't want to carry the disease back home. So he died alone. Nonetheless, that's why you see her in widow's weeds, but they are weather, rather well crafted if you take a careful look and guess whose hands did that too. So we're talking about handiwork here. And of course, cooking has to be included. Now this is my grandma Audie's handwritten recipe for raw apple cake. And she mentions nuts down there. That specifically refers to walnuts. Now when we were kids, we had to hand hull that stuff and you end up with a bottom side of your hands just being tanned dark brown and uh, you couldn't wash it off you had to wear it off nonetheless that's what she talked about so she talked about it and she referred to the little nut inside the walnut shell as candy so she said uh, you know so you, you kids go out there and uh, take care of that and bring me the candy and i'll fix up this cake and, and by the way on the back side the only thing that's not here is it was a nine by nine pan just in case you're taking notes. <laughs> I had a question. Yes. How did y'all get those walnuts back? The old-fashioned way. Huh? Between a rock and a hard place. 
Now, now I'm going to get educational for one brief shining moment. We've got the idea that the Ozark starts here when people first got here, but the truth is it's an American story. It's part of a much bigger picture. You know, you've got Jamestown starting in 1607, and I've got relatives that come in soon after that. So that very bottom rung of the roots is actually English. And then you get the Dutch, and then you get first wave of Germans, and you get the Scotch-Irish, and you go up to the tree until you get the middle part of the tree, about where that, the price of that coin or the age of that coin is, 1816. That's roughly halfway in American history right there, and that's when the Ozarks is just getting ready to be settled. Not quite, but pretty close, because we've got a territory here in Arkansas uh, gets official in a short period of time. Missouri's not a state yet, but that's halfway in American history. So if you think of the top part of the tree, all the history that we have here between Missouri and Arkansas is in the top part of the tree. And yet when folklorists are trying to dig for old things like songs, ballads and stories and things like that, they always look to the bottom side of the tree because the old stuff is centuries old and has been carried on. So that's your overview right there with 48 branches at the top. How many different languages in the Ozarks? Well, we brought old beliefs with us, old training, healing. Now there's all kinds of uh, healing, but in this particular case, I'm interested in yarbs, herbs in particular. The fellow you're looking at is uh, Chick Allen, Earl is his real name. He got his nickname Chick uh, while he and his brother went to a circus one time. I was traveling through, but there's Chick Allen, and he was a yarb doctor. Go out in the spring, and he'd dig up those roots, and there's a long list. He, you know, and I sometimes wonder, I, I knew Chick very well, and I uh, played music at his house, sought and visit with him, you know. I'd take some of my mom's uh, uh, homemade mincemeat that was made in a big crock, you know, and he'd give me some that chew of his. <laughs> We'd visit a while. At any rate, old Chick, he, he was quite the fellow, and uh, he was just an, an example. Now, he claimed to be uh, a, a quarter Cherokee and an eighth Delaware, and I wouldn't know because truth is, is that there's so many Ozarkers who claim to be part Cherokee. Who knows, you know? The only real question, if you want to get particular about things, is, well, do you, are you registered with the uh, tribe over in Oklahoma? Uh, but there's lots of people, multiples of people in the Ozarks that have a tradition that they've got a great, great grandma that was Cherokee. And so I can't say exactly, but I do know that he was a good hand at it. And I did notice one of the herbs that he dug up, he identified as Wahoo. And I wondered about that. And until uh, I come across uh, the idea that uh, there was a Cherokee word called Wahoo, which means screech owl. And of course, sometimes plants and, and, and birds and animals and such were associated together and, and, and along the spiritual ways of the Native Americans. So I wondered whether or not he had picked that up from the Cherokee. Nonetheless, uh, I knew Weather Prophet as well. His name was Les Vining. His dad was a fiddler and Les used to tell me about how they'd go out and have to spend the night on a dirt floor in a log cabin after a dance, you know. But Les was an excellent weather prophet. And in fact, he was so good that when you ask him, say, Les, uh, when's it going to rain? And he'd tell you exactly when it was going to rain, exactly how much, and exactly when it finished. I've never seen that ability in anybody else, but he had it. He had the gift for weather profiting. Until one year, he missed. It wasn't exact. It didn't happen like he said. He said, Les, he said, how come? And he said, the weather's changing. So if people are talking about climate change, I didn't first hear it from a scientist. I heard it from Les Viney. Oh, it's coming on, folks, you know, there. It, little things that people pay no attention to, but the old timers did. Like there's more and more fungus growing on red oak these days because of the warming here in the Ozarks. And it'll eventually kill out the red oak. That's what climate change really means 
in the in particular ways of somebody that lived around the woods as much as I did when I was a kid. And of course, we did have entertainment. We had spooky tales. I, I like spooky tales. We used to tell ghost tales. How many people heard ghost tales just for entertainment? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> well, one of my favorites is actually pretty modern. Uh, there was a fellow back in the 1960s that wanted to work down at Branson. He's looking for cheap housing, found it up on Mount Branson, which is that cliff uh, face on the south end, you know, near Hollister, on the Hollister side of the Taney Como. And he found it was real cheap, unusually cheap, and he didn't suspect there was a problem, so he took out the rent on it. And so he was inside here, and he was working one night, brushing his teeth, and he heard what just seemed to be a clatter like a wagon coming up uh, behind him outside you know, the window, you know, and then it came to a stop, and he looked outside, and there wasn't anything there. Right there, and then he heard the clatter again, looked again, wasn't anything there. But whatever it was, wasn't there anymore. At any rate, he went back, finished up his chore, and uh, next night he's getting ready, you know, to come in, clean up, and look in the mirror. And there was an old lady with scraggly gray hair looking at him, standing right behind him. Well, he about jumped out of his hide, turned around, and she wasn't there. Well, you know, the rent being so cheap, he decided he'd stay with it for a while <laughs> until the very next morning. <laughs> when he went into his bathroom to get ready to go to work, there's a tangle of gray hairs in his hairbrush. <laughs> the Ozarks is being over romanticized. That's my grandpa right there, framed by the last building standing in the village where he was born and raised. That's Seth Sparkman. He's in his 20s in that picture. Seth only had a third grade education. His mother died of consumption while he was quite young. They, his uh, father remarried, and uh, the new wife did not take a shine to him. He was the youngest of the family that was still staying at the house. And, he became what's called the proverbial redheaded stepchild. He was hired out as farm work at the age of eight. And things were so tough on him that by the age of 13, he had left the house for good. But you see that old fella right there on the right hand side, that's his uncle Dave. That was his mom's brother. And Dave took him out fishing and would tell him tales about how the musketry during the Civil War that he heard sounded just like popcorn popping in the pan. So he did have a friend, even in the worst of times, and finally moved on. This is a pictorial genealogy. There's the Sparkmans on the left and the Herndons on the right. And you see that's two branches of the tree right there. Uh, my father and his brothers were eating watermelon there in the lower left-hand corner. And where I couldn't find a picture, you either see a tombstone or a copy of the out of the family Bible that goes back to my three greats. But I'm only going to tell you a story about the two in the red frames. Now, the one on the left is my great-grandfather, J.A., and James Alexander Smarkman. And there to the other side is a Civil War veteran. He was an artilleryman by the name of Herndon. Well, it turned out that James J.A. bought some land just north of the Herndon place, set up a gate across the road. Well, here comes old man Herndon with his wagon because the Herndons had another 20 acres north of that field that he had bought. And old man Herndon didn't like that. And he said, take this gate out of here. You take it out right now. He said, I'm doing no such thing. So it's going to stay where it's at. And old man Herndon said, well, I'll take care of that. And he went back to his wagon and pulled out an ax. It was a wooden gate. And he was a purpose. He was going to do something about that. So he started to go up and Sparkman said, if you lay an ax on that gate, I'm going to shoot you. Well, he did, and he did. <laughs> now, old man Herndon lived because it was birdshot, 
Didn't say he lived comfortably, but he lived. And that leads us to our mystery down there. You notice the fellow in the uniform there, that's uh, Seth, who you've just met. And over to the side of his bride is Gertie. Now, it's not short for Gertrude. She had brothers named Virgie and Pearlie. Her name really was Gertie. And that's my grandma Sparkman. Nobody knows, and I asked my father many a time, and he could never explain the mystery of how a Sparkman and a Herndon married. <laughs> Just a family tale. Here's one from the turtle side. You can tell a story about a place. You can tell about a person. You can just talk about a story that's been passed down. A place, that house behind you is actually two stories. It had a stairwell and it had a step, a false step that was pulled out so that a Southern soldier that was trying to escape from the federal patrols could hide under the stairwell and slip it back in. Person, well, the person of interest in this case is my great-great-grandmother there on the right. She had a gift. And we're talking about a gift. She could foretell the death of anybody in the family by having a dream. And the dream was a black coach that was pulled up. The faceless driver. And anytime she saw that black coach, she denounced that somebody had met their end. And this was true decade after decade. And she was born as, in the 1840s. This went on for a long time. But finally, here in the 20th century, she lived to the age of 98. She announced the dream, but nobody knew of anybody that had died. Weeks passed, and they assumed she'd lost the gift. Then a letter came from California, said two cousins had died on the very date she had the dream. She was never doubted again. And as about a story, well, the fellow you see on the left is an old Civil War cavalryman that used to tell stories at the dinner table. I'm going to tell you one right now. But I have to give you a little vocabulary lesson. It's stories called the drummer. I have to put a title on it. And a drummer is a salesman. It used to be once upon a time, way back when, that uh, drummer had, was coming into town with his good smears. He would beat on a drum to let people know he was coming. So a salesman became known as a drummer. Well, here's the story. Once upon a time, a drummer was coming into town. And there was a whole passel of hogs up on one side of the hill. And he looked at them and they ran all the way down that hill and all the way across the road and all the way back the other side. And he, it was the skinniest hogs he'd ever seen. I mean, they were real rail splitters. You could see every rib they had and, even, and up at the top of the hill. He looked again and there they come back down, roared across the road and up, up the other side. And well, he decided he better move across the road before they came back. So he shoes it on out, and, he, and even behind him, that, those hogs are still going back and forth. When he comes into town, he goes up to the store, and he comes in there, and he said, boy, he says, I've seen something I've never seen before, a bunch of hogs going from one top of the hill to the other, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The storekeeper says, well, yeah, said, uh, them's Clem's hogs. said, he can tell you about it. I said, yeah, them's my hogs, all right. I lost my voice, so I had to learn them to come when I called by hitting a stump with a stick. But I never figured on those blasted woodpeckers. <laughs> the fella on the right is a great-grandfather born in 1863 by the name of Thomas Jefferson Hood. He was really a farmer. He, uh, there was no such thing as a full-time teacher back in his era. And <clears throat> 1892 would be toward the tail end of his teaching career. It, he just taught in subscription schools. Uh, winter time, you couldn't get out and work. You know, I mean, you'd have chores, but you weren't, you weren't going to work all day, every day for the week. So what happened is, is that you could go to school for at least three months. And he'd teach them even if they couldn't pay the subscription. But nonetheless, uh, he was a well-to-do farmer that took an interest in literacy. And his first student was his mother who could not read or write, but he, she always wanted to read the Bible. So that was what he taught her how to do. 
as first, and, it, and that was when he started teaching. Well, these kids are awfully well behaved. I, I don't know, you remember back when, you don't have to go back, but half the distance time-wise before you realize that kids are better behaved back once upon a time than they are now, because what they got at school, they'd get at home, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so he was going to have a well-disciplined class, except for occasionally get challenged. Now, a challenge back in these days is a very serious affair. Their story goes like this. There was no boy that was wanting to run off every teacher that showed up, big old boy, bigger than Tom. You know, Tom was one of uh, seven brothers, but they called him Banny Tom because he was small. And uh, boys came up and said to him, said, uh, Tom, he said, yeah, we need you to come down and take over because uh, this old boy's run off our teacher. And he said, well, I'll do it. So he went on down and sure enough, that old boy decided he's going to challenge him. And by challenge, I don't mean anything casual. I'm talking about an out and out fight. So he should have paid attention to the fact that Tom Jefferson's nickname was Banny. You know, a Banny rooster is mighty competitive and he had six brothers. He was well-trained long before he stepped in front of that. Went around the schoolhouse and as my grandma would say, uh, he cleaned his plow. Well, the old boy's dad wanted to get him fired. So he calls for the school board to get together. Now back in those days, school board, basically the people that built that building, <laughs> you know, so they all showed up and they had the fellow and he made his case. And then TJ gave the facts of the case. And they already knew about why the boy had been with the teacher that he run off. So it didn't take him too long to come up with a decision and the president of the board said, well, the way we look at it, you know, the boy had it coming. So he was dismissed and TJ's in the clear. And as they're walking out, the boy's father said, ah, he's just a chip off the old block. And the president said, well, we don't think much of the old block neither. <laughs> Well, we're going to be Washington County time and we're already 30 minutes. So we're going to have to be quick with this. Um, to make a long story short, that fellow that you see in the oval picture, that's who the village of Johnson's named after. And those are two of his brothers. Now, one of his brothers is featured in this two part award winning flashback from the Washington County Historical Society talking about the old Johnson farm. This Benjamin Franklin, sorry, I have to get back here for the remote people. That Benjamin Franklin there on the right below William Oliver Perry Johnson is the one that had this farm, the Seal Johnson farm. So that's my great, great uncle, okay? And you have four brothers there, one of which was killed in action. All of them belong to the uh, first Arkansas Cavalry. But I do want to point out the fact that there was a mistake in here that I want to rectify on behalf of the family. Uh, ben, who you see on the right, was called uh, a bushwhacker. Ben was a sergeant in Company D of the 1st Arkansas Cavalry. The 1st Arkansas Cavalry fought against bushwhackers. Federal or Union? Did you say? Oh, it's federal. Okay. And bushwhackers, he wasn't. They, may, they understood the fighting style. I mean, companies G and K over there in Carroll County, since you're from Carroll County, uh, turned down getting that little uh, artillery that you put on the back of a mule uh, because they said, that's not the kind of fighting we do. So at any rate, those are my Johnsons. And right here is my grandpa. That's Claude. And Lucy, if you would come up here while I'm talking quickly about Claude, this is my grandpa. He's the one that taught me traditional lifestyle. Lucy, are you awake? <laughs> <laughs> Go on up here, sweetie. Look, you see on the picture on the right, you see him with the corn cob in his mouth, pipe. This is Claude's pipe, the last one he made. So she's gonna pass it around and let you take a closer look at it while I fill you in real quick. 
At any rate, Claude plowed with the horse, called the horse Nub. If Nub died, he bought another percher and named him Nub. Had a Jersey cow to milk, and then if uh, her name was Phoebe, and if she died, the next Jersey cow was Phoebe. Somebody asked me, said, well, how come he did that? And I said, well, that's because that's the names of the animals he worked with when he was a kid. But at any rate, he, he taught me a lot of things. By the way, he's feeding the, fit, the, the cat right there. You see that pole? He's pulling up perch and putting them on the rock and the cat's gonna eat right there on the spot. On the far side of that rock is where I uh, did uh, bullfrog gigging with grandpa. And that boat you see, um, he built it right in front of my eyes. And so I'd say to all you grandparent types, that if you're doing something, let the kids watch to learn something. And then of course, Claude had a bride and that's my grandma, Audie. There's only 15 inches difference between the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this particular visit, I looked exactly like what you see on the left because that picture was taken the very same month as this. I was going up to show what our soldier boy grandson looked like in uniform. Went up to the house and saw this crow hanging over the top looking at me like a vulture. And I looked in, you know, like I, it's going to buzz bomb me or something. I walked, made past him. I said, what is that? He sit there and says, oh, that's Charlie. He said, I, I nursed him back to health. He had a wound and had maggots in it. And I cleaned him out and raised him. And he runs with the dogs now, chasing rabbits. <laughs> so at any rate, you know, I asked her what was going on. She said, well, I said, I hate to do it. I said, I had to kill a snake. I said, well, what happened? I said, well, there was this black snake going up that little tree up there where the nest is with those fledglings in it. And I went out and grabbed a, spy, uh, twig, uh, a bit of the spirea bush and ran over there and switched it and told it to get away from those birds that couldn't go up that tree and switched until it left. Said, but later on, I saw it going back up the tree. Thank you, Lucy. Give her a hand. A good show and tell person. I sit there and she says, but I looked again and that snake was going up the same tree. So I just went in and got my rifle and shot its head off. She said, I won't have a snake that don't mind. <laughs> Real quick, that's her family back in 1905. Again, about a person, a place or a story uh, where since we're running out of time, I can't tell you all of this stuff, except to say, that this is when they made the transition from log cabin to what looks to be a modern house, a nice pre-World War I design with the fish scales on the front, you know. But what you don't see is the story on that place because they use timber framing techniques with mortise, tendon, and pegs. There isn't a nail in that house. Well, fast forward to the 1990s, the landowners decided they were going to tear that old place down. They started. But they didn't finish. They said, if we knew how that thing was built, we would have never started <laughs> right there. At any rate, there's a little girl right there. If you look at the uh, seven uh, little girls in the front, kneel down there. One of them is Jewel Wasserman, friend of Audie's. I took her out after 60 years. They hadn't seen each other. So I drove Audie out there to visit with Jewel. And Jewel found out I was going to get married. And all of a sudden, she brightened up and started dancing across the room with her fingers like this going, Needles and pins, needles and pins. When a man marries, his trouble begins. <laughs> well, we're going to finish up with this old gal. The reason I have 49 ancestors instead of 50 ancestors here in the Ozarks is because her husband, Richard, died in Kentucky. And she brought her three boys by herself as a single mother in the middle of the 1830s to the Ozarks. That was what they were doing to start with, was headed this direction. So she finished the job for them. So when you're looking at this lady, you are looking at strength. She's the one that brought those boys all the way in. I could talk more about that, but time is up. And we're signing off to our remote people, so bye. <laughs> but for the crowd right here, I'm open for questions. Any questions? Yes. So I've had the joy of having the book and have read it. And oh, 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 they do oh, not know what you're talking about. 
<laughs> there is a <laughs> not everybody got one in the mail. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. You talked about um, a dog that bit the ear of a good relative, and they used the mad stone. Oh, yeah. No, I have read about mad stone. That's healing. But yeah. Your story was a little different. So, could you talk a little bit about mad stone? Okay. Mine was a little different than what I heard. Well, this one's eyewitnessed by my grandma audience. I, I actually recorded her telling this. Uh, 1913, her brother Gene got bitten in the ear by a rabbi dog, and that's the way they pronounced it in the family. You know, it was a mad dog, had rabies. And the dad, the teacher that you saw, TJ, knew that there's an old fellow by Bucks Creek that uh, had a couple of uh, mad stones, which I'll explain in just a second. So he run him over there while they uh, take care of the boy that was blubbering because he'd been hurt, scared by that dog and bit too. Well, at any rate, when it came back, the fella had a moonstone and it's a gray porous looking thing that is found in the uh, bellies of a white deer or a runt calf. And he had the instructions from the fella he got it from. He said, you wash it off with vinegar. And once you do that, then you stick the stone onto that. And it's stuck like a magnet just stuck to the wound. And when it dropped off, following the instructions, they put it into a glass of sweet milk and it turned green. And when it was done, poured that out, stuck it on again and it'd stick, but for a shorter period of time. And they finally got it to the point using that and soaking it into the milk and the milk turns green where it wouldn't stick anymore and there wasn't any green if you dipped it in the milk. That was it. He was cured. And I believe the story, not just because Audie was 12 and pretty smart girl and a careful witness, but I saw Uncle Gene's scar. Did it take a special skill to find those stones? Mad stones? Well, they're cut out, cut out of the gut of an animal and you have to be looking for them. Yeah. But if you, you know, hard to miss a white deer. And a run calf, people back in those days would easily recognize what it was. So that's that's the one you'd cut open. And did they lose their power? No. They just simply quit drawing poison because the poison was gone. Yeah. But they could be reused. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Pictures you had of your the father, your grandfather, the fishing and the cat. The, yeah. Was that in Johnson? No. Where no, that's that? not in Johnson. That was up on a, a farm. It's out in the country. Okay. No, that that no, that was. He's not descended from the Johnson oh. Jacob Johnson. Oh, okay. Jacob Johnson say would be his uncle. Okay. You know, so no, it wasn't in Johnson. Okay. But thanks for asking. I, and by the way family still has that farm. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.